So here's an anchored volume weighted average price that's anchored simply to this significant low over here. And, you know, I would not anchor a volume weighted average price on that day because I'd be looking at going, this stock's in a downtrend. This day looks just like this day or this day. I don't know that's a low. But when it starts to rally, even way over here, then I'll say, you know what, that looks like a significant low. I'm going to put my anchor to that low right there. And I'm going to keep an eye on it and see how that stock progresses. And you can see there's two touches where almost precisely it hits. And I can show you this stuff on it. If, if we have time, I'll show you some you know, stocks of the DAX, the NASDAQ, where they've just done this. I mean, they've, they're doing it. You see this stuff happen all the day. So this green dot, the, you know, where you see the, you know, people always ask me, where do I set the anchor? Should I set it to the high, to the low, to the close? And the only answer is you set it to, um, how many people use TradingView? That's a lot. Okay. Trading view has, even if you have the free trading view, there's a great anchored volume weighted average price, the one they build. So when you go on the left hand side under tools, I think it's the second like little icon down, open that drop down, and at the bottom is the anchored VWAP, and it's a point and click anchor. And they'll give you the opportunity to set standard deviation bands around it if you want. I don't use those. Um, they'll also say, do you want to use high, low, close divided by three? high, low divided by two, or just the high. Some people say, I want to just know from the highs. Well, what you're saying is the only thing that mattered on this day to you was the volume that traded at the exact high of that day. That doesn't represent the consensus of what happened. So the only one that you should, that I, I've told trading to this, why do you even offer these other uh, options? They shouldn't be available. It's open high, low divided by four. That's the only one you should use because you want all the volume from the open. You want all the volume that happened in the middle of the day and you want all the volume at the close. That gives you the true average price. So that's good to see that so many people use that software. If you, you know, find those settings and make it OHLC divided by four. Where you see a dot on that first candle, it just looks like a dot. That's the actual VWAP for that day. Or if this was a one minute chart, it would say from 9.30, 00 to 93100, the average price it traded in that minute is that dot. That's where your anchor begins. So this is just taking this and expanding this area right here so we can take a closer look at it. So again, I wouldn't have set the anchor probably until about that third white candle. And you might say, well, you're late. And you know, I would look at it and say, that's that's good. Something's going on here but I'm not gonna chase it. It just went from 30 to 33 or whatever it might be. But later on, as the stock progresses, I'm gonna set, you know, re remind myself of that and see when it gets touched, if it's defended, and is there an opportunity in there? So the reason that it's often an opportunity is because a guy is like this guy. This is Ken Griffin. Ken Griffin last year, through his hedge fund, and through Citadel Trading, which is the, the leading market maker uh, in the world, they do, uh, you know, in the US, they do 35% of all listed trades. 35% of all the volume in the US markets, listed stocks, goes through this gentleman's firm. So when he talks, you kind of have to listen, especially when he's under oath in front of Congress, as he was two years ago, uh, they, he was brought into Congress by uh, Maxine Waters, the, uh, and they were grilling them about the GameStop fiasco. How could this happen? How could all these people lose this money? Are our markets broken? What's going on? And Ken Griffin said to them, and this is an exact quote, today virtually all trades executed by institutional investors are in the form of program trades such as VWAP. Here's the, the guy who's made more money out of the market ever th than anyone in the history of the world made in one year is telling you, this is what we're doing, guys. So kind of good idea to pay attention. And he said that the VWAP trades are executed over the course of a day, a week, or a month. So these institutions are using VWAP orders every day. And I'll give you the real quick version of why. I, I gave a real detailed version in the book. But basically... You know, an institution might need to buy, let, let's say a company just reported earnings and they say, 
uh, I'm going to buy this stock over the next three months until the next earnings report. We have a you know two billion dollar fund, so in order to take a meaning, meaningful position, we've got to get at least a hundred million dollars of this stock in the next three months. And we can't just obviously go in the next day with a hundred million dollar order because the stock's going to go from thirty to eighty seven that day, and then it's just going to fall apart. So they want to be. You know, they want to participate. The volume weighted average price when it was invented in 1998, 88 rather, was meant to say, here's how well you're executing your order versus the volume that's done throughout the day. It's known as the price a naive trader could expect to get. So as long as you're not doing you know, more than five to 10% of the daily volume, you have a pretty good chance of getting that order executed. So let's say we have $100 million worth, or let's just call it 100 million shares, just, just to keep the math easy. And we have 100 days to do it. It's obviously less than that um, for the next quarter at 63. Uh, but let's say we have 100 days to do it, and we're going to buy a million dollars worth each day. Well, what we would typically do is we would actually say we want to buy 5 million this week. Well, typically, 20% of the weekly or 40% of the weekly volume occurs on Monday. So we're going to buy 2 million shares on Monday because that's 40% of what we have to do for the week. Then they'll look at that Monday trade and they'll say the first 10 minutes of the day typically does 10% of the volume. So they'll design their algorithms to buy 200,000 shares in that first time minute, 10 minute block and they'll spread it throughout the day. So when it's, you know, half of a percent of the volume is done at 12:32 PM, they're going to do, a half of 1% of their order. They're going to buy $500,000 worth. So they do this so that they don't tip their hand to the market. The market doesn't know that there's this big buyer. They're just trying to sneak in there and participate with all the rest of the volume. They don't want to tip their hand and they don't want to give away to the market that there's this big buyer in here. So he, he also said, which is not here, but these orders are all, they're not big blocks. Of course, you have your dark pool and that sort of thing. But they're going to be two, three, five hundred shares. They're just sitting there on the bid, taking a couple pennies here, you know, taking a couple hundred shares at a time until they fill that twelve thirty-two a.m. where they have to buy twenty-three thousand six hundred shares because it typically does two hundred thirty-six thousand shares. And that's the way they participate. They're not trying to be competitive necessarily. Sometimes they will, you know, have a better trader who says. Give me the order. I'm going to beat the VWAP. And, you know, that's where the human element comes in. The human trader will say, I can do this order today. I can beat VWAP by 10 cents. If I beat, 10, beat the VWAP by 10 cents, uh, we give the, the client half of those savings and five cents of that 100,000 shares goes into our bonus pool. And that's the way, you know, the, then you have the firm who's doing the buy order help uh, you know, be in be in the same be on the same team as the uh, customer they're working for. So the main way that we're going to use anchored volume weighted average price. I'm not going to go into all the details, but is is support and resistance. That is not all the details in the book. And I think I have to speed this up a little bit. Um, but we want to, you know, we want to look at it. And here's a chart with, you know, a, again one day, and this this stock gaps up. You can see it on the left, and runs higher and it just looks like it's you know in an uptrend throughout the day but there's actually a couple pretty good pullbacks so this is one of the, a strategy that i wrote about in 2008 and got more in detail in the book as well which is chase the gap or wait for vwap so when a stock gaps up i never get involved in the first five minutes or so i'm sitting and watching and then to see if it starts pulling back i love it when they start pulling back like this because you can see for the first 15 minutes or so, maybe 30 minutes of the day, the sellers had control of the stock. And it was just natural profit taking. And some short, you know, there were some shorts in there saying, hey, it's up too much, let's short it. Let's see if it closes the gap and that sort of thing. But that moment at number three, where it gets back above the volume weighted average price for the day, you know, 32 minutes into the day, tells us with 100% certainty, now the buyers are back in control. The average price that this is traded at is above the volume weighted average price. It's the buyers who have control. So I like to buy at number three and set my stop at number two, just under number two. So if it's, you know, 62, uh, $68 even, 
that or 61.92 was that low, I usually put my stop two pennies below it uh, is my initial stop. Once I know the buyers have gained control. As it breaks out for that high of the day and it runs that first you know, dollar really quickly, I'll often sell my first third. Because we're still in that early morning period where things can reverse on us. So I like to reduce my risk. This is for a day trade. And then see if I can hold it longer. I would, on this one, I would have been out just above that. You see that first lower high and then it breaks a lower low and comes down to the VWAP. I would have been out underneath that higher low. So that's what I mean by raising it up underneath the higher low for the time frame you're engaged. As it pulled back to the number four, I'd be looking at saying, hey, it's back to VWAP. I'm not going to buy here, but I'm going to start to look at this very carefully. I'm going to look at my level two now. I'm not going to look at the level two all day and look at there and my eyes go crazy. Um, And who can concentrate that much? But as it starts to rally away from that number four, I'm going to buy it again and set my stop underneath number four. And same thing in the afternoon. I'm not going to buy the pullback to it, but if it rallies back away from it, then I'm going to get involved. Nowhere in that chart would I be interested in shorting the stock. There's two good pullbacks, but again, the sum of the rallies is greater than the sum of the declines. We're above the VWAP, so you're fighting the trend. There's just no point that I ever have found that it makes sense to do that. Uh, this is Roku, which is, I think, having trouble right now. This is about a week or so ago. Uh, but Roku, from the year-to-date anchored VWAP, the buyers had been in control over and over again. The sellers took control. They reported earnings. And now this stock, I think, is likely to disappoint a lot of people. When it gets back below a significant anchor uh, anchored VWAP like this one, you got to pay attention and say, now the average short seller during that entire time is now making money. So what are they going to do? They're going to start to press. They're going to put offers out to try to scare you into selling. They're going to try to, you know, take back control. And what about the longs? How is the average long participant feeling in here? The average long at $56.56 is down about $2 because the average price from that low is $2 higher. So it's about trying to get into the psychology of the average participant. So when we see a stock in a downtrend like this, we want to look at those rallies up to the VWAP. And you can look here and see, you know, there were a couple of times it hit it precisely. And then just, you know, so you look at it and say, wow, it hit it perfect. I knew I should have shorted there. I'm always more interested in shorting as it breaks down and proves that that was, in fact, an important high. So I'm going to short on those green circles and set my stop up above the prior red arrow. Because if I short there, there's no way of knowing that it's not going to be that time that it reverses and you're out a bunch of money. I always want to be on the winning side. So again, we anchor to important lows in uptrends and we see that often it acts as support, but not always. So if you're buying that pullback there, or let's look at this one. You know, if you bought it at 39, is it hit that? Well, then, or 3, 339. Well, two days later, you were down five points. That's not a winning strategy. Where does your stop go? It you know, becomes the question. So where we set the anchor is really the most subjective part. The analysis of it is easy. Where we want to set the anchor is big volume events, something that, you know, really rattles the market. It gets perception change rapidly. We want to anchor there because it might have been an earnings report where these gaps are occurring or you know, in the big volume. Who knows what the reason is? The reason really doesn't matter so much. It's how does the stock respond after that event? Do Are the buyers able to maintain control? And this is very typical that you'll see a gap up and it holds the VWAP and then see a little bit of shakeout and then it begins to get going. So it's had a big run. It just needs time to catch its breath. Uh, it's like running around the track. You can't run at full speed. you got to slow down, rest, get your energy, and then run again. It's the same thing for stocks. Gaps, year-to-date is a good one. A lot of institutions use the uh, year-to-date anchored view app. Um, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Alpha Trends. I'm going to uh, uh, tweet a link to a study a friend of mine did about the year-to-date anchored VWAP. Um, I've always known it worked, but I've never done like a back test, you know, proper study of it. He did that. So I'm going to tweet that probably tomorrow. 
Um, the, vo the volume weighted average price from the Federal Reserve, the ECB. Like if you look at today's action on, on the FTSE, from where, you know, from the moment, I don't know what time they do it here because I don't, I don't trade that market, but you know, from the very moment that the Federal Reserve at 2 p.m. announced 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time announces any change to monetary policy, the first thing I do is click my VWAP, and it's there. And I started on a one-minute chart, and as I get about 20 minutes of data, I'll change it to a two-minute chart. As I get about an hour worth of data, I'll change it to a five-minute chart, and watch how it develops. We just bounced the S&P 500 just bounced yesterday from the VWAP from the Fed last week. And it does that really often. This is not unusual for it to be useful for up to about two weeks. But for that two week period, a lot of times, it didn't happen so much here, but a lot of times you'll see on day three, it hits it and bounces. Day five, it hits it and bounces. Day six, it turns sideways and then breaks below it. And then it bounces back up and finds supply there on day seven, and then it falls apart. That's really, you know, that type of action is, is very typical. Um, earning reports are one of the biggest catalysts for most people in the market. It's that, you know, every three months they get the opportunity to get the report card and say, how well is this company doing? Do, is this something I want to buy or sell? So that first earnings report, obviously people were enthusiastic about it. The second one, there was, you know, maybe a little bit of a problem because it, it was, you know, it pulled back to the VWAP from the higher earnings report, but then it got stuck below that one. Then it looks like they had two bad quarters. And look at how the VWAP from the beginning of the earnings report, you know, acted as resistance and, and or support on the first one and as resistance on the second ones. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. When you look at the charts, I still do. I've been using the anchored VWAP, uh, you know, the, uh, since 2003, and it still blows my mind when I look at it and say, it just hit it perfect. And then just a beautiful rally occurred or, you know, fell apart from. So again, here, you know, on this one, on the right, you know, there's a little bit of noise around that area. Let it, you know, pull back down hard to the anchor from that low. And that low was six months prior. That's May to November. It settled down, but then the buyers regained control. So at that green arrow, I would you know, anchor another VWAP and say, now I want to measure this rally off of the major rally. Does anyone know what we call that when we set a new anchor to the touch of the buyer anchor uh, touch? Hand off, yes. You've read the book already. Um, so same thing in a downtrend. You know, rallies up to it are often going to act as resistance, but it's not always perfect. So we want to use that as the place to observe our analysis on a shorter term time frame and find evidence that it's time to so I look at the daily time frame and say, here's the big trend. I'm not going to short it right here, but if it starts to back away from it on the shorter term time frame, as it's just breaking below a key level, I'm going to short there with my stop above the most recent relevant lower high. Um, so this is kind of my favorite part. And I I should probably change this because I make it earlier because. You know, all last year and, you know, late 2021 and all of 2020, well, first half of 2021, the mantra from everyone was buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And I would just shake my head and man, just these people are going to get murdered because these stocks are in downtrend. These are not dips. These are stocks in downtrend. These are patterns of lower highs and lower lows. It's not a dip. A pullback in an uptrend if it starts to bounce away from it, then you can say that was a dip. But you know, don't buy the dip. Buy strength after the dip. Uh, so we don't want to buy the dip. And I don't think you want to buy breakouts, not most of them. Um, you don't want to short the rip. So if you buy the dip, like in these red highlighted areas, the question is, what if you bought on you know, the third day of this pullback? Well, then you had to wait. Or, so these are weeks, actually. So on the third week, you had to wait three months for it to get any momentum. And if they didn't scare you out with your stop, I'd be looking and go, man, I've been in the stock for three months. It's doing nothing. Meanwhile, all these other stocks are going, I'm going to sell that dog and get into something that's working. So we don't want to buy the dip uh, is, is the way I do. Because then where do you set your stop? And if you buy the breakout you know, to the new high, you're often getting in after the stock has made, you know, oftentimes they're about an 8 to 10% rally in the three to four days prior to a breakout. And then when I own the stock 
at these points, I always sell some on the breakout because I look at it and say, you know what? It's uneducated money buying the breakout. They didn't consider this stock was up 8% in the last three days. And how often do we hear people complaining, you know, breakouts don't work anymore? Well, it's because you're buying extended breakouts. If you've got a you know real nice tight range and it breaks out of that range, I'm all for buying those, but not buying this breakout up here, right? So as it hits that high. And I don't want to buy in here where I've got all this risk. Maybe it's just going to fall apart and keep going down. So I want to buy when it gets above, above the volume weighted average price from that prior peak. Because at that point, when we anchor a VWAP there, we would have maybe done it on day three. We look at this and say, okay, the sellers are in control right now. So if you look at the FTSE and look at the most recent high about three or four weeks ago, we're still below that VWAP, but we're also hitting the year-to-date volume weighted average price, the volume weighted average price from the recent low and from a low a year ago. So as it gets back above that volume weighted average price, I know that the average buyer in here I know with certainty is now in a winning position. I know the average short seller who shorted this big candle down in here, the average participant is now losing money on the short side. The buyers are in control. That's where I want to buy. I don't want to buy over here on the breakout. I want to, and I don't want to buy the pullback. So I don't want to buy the pullback and I don't want to buy the breakout. On the, on the short side, the same is exact as opposite. You know, people hear all the time, oh, just we're going to sell the rip market. Well, they don't sell the rip. What if it keeps ripping? I mean, you know, there's no worse feeling than shorting a stock at 25 and a half. And then two days later, the stock's at 29. If you're in a short, you know what your risk is. It's unlimited, theoretically. There's no guarantee that it's going to continue down. A trend once established is more likely to continue than reverse. But if it just continue, if it does reverse and you're short at 25 and a half, and it's a 29, it's a 30, and it keeps going, you know, the fear is real. The losses are real. And we similar, similar don't want to short those breakdowns because they've already had big drops. Look at this one. It dropped from 36 to 30 and then broke down. So it dropped 20%. And then shorting it right here, sure, it would have worked, but not as well as if you shorted there with your stop above that most recent high. So we want to sh sell short weakness after the rally. So once the sellers have regained control and set our stop above that most recent relevant high. These are a couple of trades uh, just from the last couple of weeks. Um, this was Mondelez, MDLZ. Uh, they make Oreos, I think, or something like that. Uh, they're the food people. Anyways, the stock went on to become a monster. Uh, I sold it ahead of earnings. But on the daily chart on the left, so what we're doing is we're combining multiple time frames to find this is my favorite type of buy. We've got a stock in established uptrend. So if you look at the stock in that box, well, in this area where it's below that, you know, we, we set the anchor to that gap that kind of signaled the end of that big rally from 63 to 70, and it began a pullback. So probably on this day right here, I would have set an anchor to that gap and said, okay, the sellers are in control from there. And this is exactly what I did. And we were stuck below that VWAP for you know five or six days below that anchored VWAP. And then we saw a little bit of a battleground right there. And that was the process of the buyers regaining control. The short sellers might've been trying to short it to hold it back. They couldn't hold it back. That green dot, that's what I like to buy. It did break out past that. I think it was $71.70. I don't know why I remember that. Uh, no, you know what? I bought it at $70. Yeah, I think it was seventy-one seventy. I sold my first third on the breakout. And it kept going. And I thought, I don't care. But then the next day, it pulled back a little bit. And then it made those higher highs and higher lows. I didn't sell on that gap lower because I never sell in the first five minutes. I wait for that first five-minute low to be established. Then if it breaks below that five-minute low on minute six, then I'm out. But I always give it five minutes. So I, and that saved me countless times from just throwing my stock away first thing in the morning. But that's where I want to buy. And I sold it on that day there at 72 uh, because they were reporting earnings the next day. Well, I thought they were, but they actually reported the day after. Then I went to 75. Then they reported earnings. I think it's at like 83 or 84. And that doesn't bother me. I knew what I was in that trade for. I knew I wanted to be out before the earnings report because it might have just fallen apart. And this is this was almost the, the same time. This was you know on the short side. 
I set a couple anchors to the recent low, the blue year to date. And then the anchor from this gap lower, which is in that box, that's that first big red candle. So the buyers took control for a little while. The sellers defended at the year to date blue anchored VWAP. And then as it broke down over here, I shorted it. And that's, you know, that's obviously not going to happen every single time. But had it not, I would have been out with a small loss. So these are the types of trades that I spend my days looking for during the day when I'm not, you know, when I just have a position on, I've set my stop. I'm scouring for, through stocks, looking for these types of setups. That's what I do every day. So here's our kind of wrap up. And I think I'm actually doing pretty good for time. Oh, I'm a little over. Apologies, Ricardo. Um, so to me, it's the most powerful tool I've ever come across. And it really wasn't until 2015 where I really was able to appreciate it as much because that's the first time I convinced a trading platform, TC2000, to add the point and click anchor to their chart. Now it's on trading view like most of you use. And I encourage you, even if you, you're not convinced by what I'm saying here, what I've written in my book, just play around with it. Add it as another tool to your analysis. I'm not here to tell anyone how to trade. If you've got something, if sunspots work for you and you're making consistent money, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. Keep doing what works for you. But if you add this, I think, and in fact, I promise, it's going to add another uh, level of confidence to each of your trades because you're going to know with 100% certainty who has control since that gap or the earnings or the Federal Reserve announcement or the breakout or a breakdown, swing highs and swing lows. If you follow me on Twitter, I put a lot of these things out there. I put a, uh, uh, one on Tesla today. Tesla's you know, rallied up to a prior level of support that has the potential to become resistance. And it's the anchored VWAP from the year to date. It's the anchored VWAP from the most recent high. We're still above the anchor from the earnings eight days ago. But if that breaks, I think lights out for Tesla for a little while. So it's in a really critical level. I'm not short it. I don't want to be short it until it breaks down with conviction. And then if it breaks down with conviction, I'm going to set my stop. So if it reverses, I'll take a small loss. But it's setting up as though maybe it's a short sale. So those are the things that I look at. These are my two books. If you've seen them or haven't, there's, uh, I don't know if they're giving them away, but uh, there's a stack of them outside uh, of the anchored VWAP one. And that one is uh, also available on Amazon UK. And there we go. I didn't do too bad on time, I guess. <laughs>